Let us pray. Loving God, your word is a lamp to our pathway. For that we are grateful because it is hard to discern those pathways at times. So open our hearts and our minds that we might discern your call in our lives and the call upon your word on our souls. Amen. We join Jesus early in his ministry. And as he makes his way to Jerusalem for the Passover on dusty roads along with thousands upon thousands of faithful pilgrims. I was thinking about this. I know we all want to travel again, but I don't think I'd want to trade places with those pilgrims on that sometimes long, always difficult journey to Jerusalem. Faithful pilgrims came to the temple to offer sacrifices for healing, for forgiveness, for thanksgiving. And to do so, they needed unblemished animals. And so a pilgrim walking for miles, unsure of her own food and shelter, risking bandits along the way, could hardly drag along an unblemished animal and hope to arrive with an unblemished animal. So when she actually made it to Jerusalem, best to purchase one from the conveniently located animal traders. Faithful pilgrims came to pay their temple tax, their pledges. Little history. Ever since the Exodus, all eligible, mainly male, but all eligible Israelites paid a half shekel in silver to the communal fund of the temple to ensure that the sacrifice, the sacrifice for atonement, could be made daily on behalf of the entire community. And to pay his pledge, to do that in the temple, our pilgrim could only use silver shekels with no images stamped upon them. Images were blasphemous. And so if the commandments are to be obeyed and the holy purposes of these pilgrims to be fulfilled, this is where the money changers and politics come in. Judah is under the thumb of the Roman Empire. And under Roman law, Jews were permitted to mint coins only in bronze or copper. And Roman coins had the emperor's image stamped on it. So the money changers offered an essential service for a small fee. They exchanged the bronze and copper coins minted by Jews from all over the empire and the Roman coins with the emperor's head stamped on it for the silver shekels needed at the temple. The Romans appointed all the officials in the temple, including Caiaphas, the chief priest. And Caiaphas had moved the sellers of these animals, the traders of these animals, from the Mount of Olives over into the temple complex. And many Jews objected to this. So when Jesus arrived at the temple, he found the traders of oxen and cattle and doves selling right there in the temple complex and the money changers seated at their tables. Now, at every holiday, there's always one person in the family who gets carried away. And on this Passover, Jesus outdid them all. And I don't think I'd trade places with those traders. <laughs> Making a whip of cords, no owl, not a hockey stick. Jesus drove them all out. He tipped over the tables and poured out the coins that the money changers had changed and turned those tables upside down. And it wasn't just the high-end ox and sheep traders. He went for the bottom of the pyramid ones, too, the ones selling the little doves. Doves, the offering of the poor. Doves, the offering his mother made at the temple after he was born. Take these things out of here and stop making my father's house a house of trade. Actually, I don't think I'd want to trade places with anybody that day. I think it would have turned me upside down. And they call this story Jesus cleansing the temple. But I don't think Jesus' anger is aimed at dishonesty or abuses or even people selling the animals. 
and it's not some kind of confrontation with commercialism. This story is less about cleansing the temple and much more about who Jesus is. Right here at the start of Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of John, he chases out, he pours out our assumption about God's presence in our lives, and he overturns our way of being God's people. Because God coming to dwell among us, to dwell in us, the word made flesh, full of grace and truth, turns everything upside down. And if we're honest, we don't need to trade places with the ones who demand a sign. We are those people. Because it's easy to get turned upside down by the words that Jesus speaks, and we miss the meaning And more importantly, we fail to see their sacred purposes. But let's not focus quite on Jesus' impatience with them, because Jesus has patience with us. Jesus was misunderstood by the crowds who crushed in on him, by the authorities who opposed him, by his disciples who loved him, and by us. And I think the people in this story might have wished they could have traded places with the people who heard John's gospel 60 years later. After all, John's community had all those years to think about it. Maybe they read Paul's letters. They may have been able to hear Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, Luke's gospel. But I think they still would have misunderstood. John was writing his gospel to heal three generations of not understanding. And he wrote this gospel because the community was deeply divided about who they thought Jesus was, who they experienced Jesus to be, and who they thought Jesus will be in the future. And most of all, what it means to follow him. So what's new about not getting it? What was the word God gave to Isaiah 800 years before these people didn't understand? What did he say? My people don't understand. So what was Jesus doing in the temple? It's, I think, less a fit of temper and more a bit of protest. In the deepest, truest sense of the word, protestari, to witness or testify for something. John shows us Jesus, God's righteous presence among us. God's righteous presence among us, overturning not just how we worship, but how we live. And I think this portion from Isaiah this morning gives us the stakes. God is saying, I can't bear it any longer. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Will you stop the mishigash? Isaiah is saying, God is over the extravaganzas you think are going to take God's mind off how you live. So here's an idea. Stop doing the stuff that gets God down and learn to do the stuff that gives God delight. And so in Jesus, in John's gospel, he shows us a kind of living temple, a new kind of temple, a new way for God and humanity to dwell together. And no less animated than Isaiah, Jesus cleared the space making room for God's sacred promises in our lives, making room for us to become God's dwelling place. So what are we doing in here this morning in this house? If we are God's dwelling place, does this spell the end of brick and mortar? St. Paul would say, by no means. This place, this house, is a sacred place because of what happens here. In here, we set apart sacred time for sacred things. This is where we worship the one who loves us enough to die for us, where we give thanks for that sacrificial love with offerings of time and treasure, faith and love and service. And it's where we listen and learn. To listen for God's call in our life and learn how 
to seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. And so I think as we're in the midst of Lent, I can't believe it's the third Sunday of Lent, uh, it seems like a good time for a bit of spiritual house cleaning with no whips of cords or hockey sticks. I ask you this. Are we, in ourselves, a house of trade, a trading place for passing transactions, undervaluing what we have received or what we have to give? Are we emporia of dysphoria, selling joy without justice, rejoicing without righteousness, with little faith, hope, or love in our inventory, exchanging the priceless gifts that God places in each one of us for currency that loses its value? Or will we become the dwelling place for God's living presence with an infinite supply chain of God's transforming grace? Will we become God's house? Actually, I think we should become more like God's tent because Jesus did not stay in his father's house. He didn't ensconce himself in the holiness of the temple and say, come to me. Jesus went out and delivered it. And if we've learned anything over the last year, it's the value and beauty of delivery. God dwells in us, full of steadfast love and mercy and grace. But God is also a God who delivers. And he's calling us to lifetime employment as essential workers in logistics and courier service. We've been blessed. We have a lot of transforming love and mercy and grace to distribute it and a whole world filled with God's children who need for us to get it to their door. It's a huge job. But if we've learned anything over the last year, we have within us the capacity to do hard things, to do seemingly impossible things, to do hard jobs. So let not your heart be troubled. What God requires, God also inspires. God's spirit dwells within us, reviving our souls and gladdening our hearts. And so my friends, may we become a temple, a dwelling place, which is not only a place to go, but a way to be a way to be that welcomes God and all of God's people home. Amen.